So I'm here with uh, my second lecture from the Hospital Center Resuscitationist. And this was a bit of a deep dive on advanced Doppler, th Doppler theory, especially when it comes to calculating flow in central versus peripheral arteries. So just a touch of background uh, on, Dop on the Doppler effect, with which I'm sure most of you are familiar. So this is an artistic interpretation of a suprasternal notch view of uh, the descending aorta using duplex ultrasound. And this is supposed to be the image, and this is the descending aorta with your PW gate over it. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit less about this. In fact, I'm not going to talk at all about this. And I'm going to focus on what I think is actually a much more interesting part of the duplex Doppler or the duplex ultrasound, and that's ignoring the B mode and focusing more on the Doppler, um, as indicated here. As you can see, the Doppler gives velocity, the velocity of blood, the velocity of the moving scatters, which are the red blood cells. So the way that the Doppler effect works is, or Doppler ultrasound works, is there's a carrier frequency that's emitted by a transmitter, and it just emits ultrasound and a red blood cell moves through it, and sound waves bounce off of the red blood cell and they're met by the receiver. And the analogy that I frequently use is it's somewhat like, it's not completely analogous to you, but it's somewhat like um, listening to an ambulance drive up the street. The frequency of the siren on the ambulance is the carrier frequency or the transmit frequency, which would remain unchanged for the ambulance driver, but for the observer on the street as the ambulance approaches, the observer will hear a change in the frequency of the of the uh, of the ambulance siren. And that change in frequency from the transmit frequency that the ambulance driver is hearing compared to the observer is going to be directly proportional to the velocity at which the ambulance is moving. And so that's this change, this delta frequency between the observer and the ambulance driver, as that frequency goes up, as the pitch goes up, you can see that it's directly proportional to the velocity, and this is the velocity here. This is the uh, transmit frequency, the cosine of the angle at which the scatterer is moving, and the speed of sound in tissue. And as we know, the scatterers can move at different angles, for example, at 45 degrees, or even at 90 degrees to the ultrasound beam and this will change the velocities. Although if you've ever played with an ultrasound and you've uh, insinated blood that you think is moving it perpendicular to the ultrasound beam and you still see velocities, uh, that is partly a, a consequence of spectral broadening, which I'll touch on in a bit. So you can get velocity at the bedside. You can get velocity of moving blood. Who cares? So you can plot the velocity on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And if you had a hypothetical um, object that's moving uh, at a constant velocity over a certain period of time, you can actually say something about the distance that it's traveled. We know that velocity is distance divided by time, or that distance is velocity times time. And here you can see that the velocity times time is simply the area of this rectangle. Uh, base times height. So the base is time, the height is velocity, so then the area is the distance that this object has traveled. So you can do that with a rectangle, and you can do it with uh, more oddly shaped velocity time profiles as well, like a Doppler pulse. And so if you took one point in time here, and you took the area, and then you did it again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and you sum them all up, well you've done an integral You've determined the area under the curve, and you've determined the distance that this blood has traveled. So the t velocity time integral is the distance. Who cares? Well, if you know the distance that the blood has traveled, you can imagine this hockey puck of blood moving forward in this blood vessel. If you were insinating it with Doppler, and you measured its velocity, and then you did the area under its velocity time curve, you could get the distance that it traveled. Then, if you knew the radius of the blood vessel, you could calculate the, the area of the, um, of the blood vessel itself, 
and the area times the length that has traveled is the volume that the blood has moved, moved in one beat. And if you know that over many heartbeats, you actually know the flow through that particular vessel. Volume is the area of the hockey puck times the length that, it, that has traveled or the distance that you got from the VTI. So there's a few different ways, or there's a couple different ways that you can measure the velocity. Uh, very broadly, there's continuous wave and pulsed wave Doppler. And the way continuous wave works, I think it's, it's um, intensivists are probably less familiar with continuous wave Doppler, is it, it just transmits ultrasound into the body agnostic to uh, anatomic location. It just blindly shoots ultrasound into the tissue and will essentially interact with any moving scatterers that get in its path. So here you can imagine three red blood cells. One's green and moving fast, and one's yellow and not so fast, and the other is moving more slowly. And they're all going to move through this ultrasound beam, and there'll be a receiver as well that is constantly listening. And what, the, what it will sound like, or what you'll see in your spectrogram in the velocity time plot, is the max velocity of the green will represent the the red the scatterer that's moving the fastest while the medium and then the slowest are depicted here. In a pulsed wave system usually this a single uh, crystal acts as the transmitter and the receiver. The beauty of pulsed wave is that because you uh, shoot a pulse and then you wait a certain given period of time to listen for it you can actually directly locate where you want to incinate. So you can pick your target in terms of depth and location in the body, which allows it to be incorporated quite nicely with B mode. So you can um, target vessels that are deep within the abdomen or the thorax or wherever you're looking. And so as I mentioned, it pulses and then it listens. It pulses and then it listens. And so when you're incinating a blood vessel like this and you're just pulsing the very middle of the vessel, you may actually only pick up the fastest moving scatterer and you may miss the other two. And so that's a brief overview of how you can get the, the velocity time profile and what they would look like with continuous wave versus pulsed wave. So let's talk a little bit about velocity error. So there's some intrinsic aspects to velocity error and one of them is called geometric spectral broadening and this can <clears throat> plague both pulsed wave systems and continuous wave systems, but the design of pulsed, waves, pulsed wave uh, multi-element transducers, which I've uh, illustrated up here, these are all the different elements in the transducer head, puts them at uh, particular risk for this. So if you imagine you're insinating a blood vessel and there's a scatterer in the middle moving in this direction, and you're insinating at angle theta, with this single uh, element. Now the way that duplex, this is usually done with duplex with PW system. So you're doing an image and a Doppler and it's actually doing both of them in succession. It's not doing them at the same time the way these devices are built. Um, and what happens is you get a velocity time profile. But the elements just off to the right and to the left of the main element are also incinating the same scatterer, but at slightly different angles. And so if you watch the velocity time curve as the different elements incinate the scatterer, it tends to overestimate the velocity uh, from these elements and actually underestimate the velocity from this element. So what you see what's happened is you sort of have a smearing of the velocity, uh, and this is called spectral broadening. And you're clearly overestimating the, the true velocity based on the aperture length uh, of the Doppler system. And so an equation has been derived for this. This is the maximal velocity. Um, and I believe that Hoskins derived this equation, or at least he's written extensively about it. But you can see that I'm torturing you with math and you're pulling your hair out and wondering why. I just want to show that this d is the length of the aperture, so it's directly, the velocity overestimation is directly proportional to that, and it's actually inversely proportional to l, which is the, 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 the length to the scatterer. 
So it's, I think it's somewhat intuitive that if it's directly proportional to the width of the aperture, as the aperture gets wider, the, the spectral broadening of effect would become more pronounced as it's being looked at from these various perspectives. And it's inversely proportional to the length here. So actually, um, the, the more near the scatterer is to the aperture, the greater it is, uh, the greater the risk for this spectral broadening effect. And manufacturers actually take advantage of this, and what they do is they create dynamic apertures. And the fascinating thing is that different ma manufacturers actually have different algorithms for how the dynamic apertures work. So if you're insinating a deeper um, target, you can actually then uh, widen the aperture, because as I mentioned, it's inversely proportional to the depth. So if, the, if it's deep, that means you're less susceptible to the, to the spectral broadening area. So some manufacturers then have a wider aperture to sort of balance it out. And with the wider aperture, you get more imaging um, or a broader imaging field. And so um, clinicians tend to like imaging, so often manufacturers will do this to um, optimize images. But this manufacturer has a completely different aperture for the same insonation depth. And this is, I forget, this was a study done, I think, 10 or 15 years ago. But at all different insonation depths, the aperture width actually changes um, without really any sort of standardization. So this will change your spectral broadening, but actually between different manufacturers, between two different pulse wave systems. And there's actually data out there for patients who are um, being evaluated for carotid endarterectomy. The velocity of blood moving through the carotid is used to predict the narrowing in the carotid artery, and there are patients that meet criteria for endarterectomy on one machine, and then they are evaluated by the same sonographer with a different machine, and they do not make the criteria for endarterectomy. So there can be real clinical implications for this um, lack of standardization in aperture width. So that was one kind of intrinsic, uh, that was one kind of intrinsic velocity error. The second you may have already heard of, it's called cosine error. And here it's just a, it's a function of the cosine function. So you can see that um, it slopes downwards. So as you change your angle of insonation, your degrees of freedom for error changes. So if you, for example, pick uh, uh, to insonate an artery and you say that it's 45 degrees, There's going to be a little bit of error on both sides, so maybe it's 40, maybe it's 40 degrees, maybe it's 50 degrees, and so that will change. That will put your cosine in uh, within this range, and as the cosine gets higher, so as the if the true angle is actually a little bit lower, then the velocity is underestimated, and you can see that your your error distribution at 45 degrees is actually somewhat different than if you're insinating at 60 degrees, there's a slightly broader error, error distribution. So here, if you're insinating it, if you mark it as 60 degrees, but in actuality, you're insinating at say 70 degrees, well, the cosine here is, is much smaller than it would be at 60 degrees, and a smaller cosine means an overestimation in velocity. So based on this, uh, most recommend that uh, you shouldn't insinate over uh, 60 degrees because the error uh, becomes more steep for uh, velocity estimation. So those are two kinds of intrinsic errors, the, the spectral broadening and the aperture width to depth ratio and uh, the cosine error. Now I'm going to focus a little bit on uh, an extrinsic aspect of velocity error, error. So we talked about this already a little bit before, the velocity time intervals distance but what is the assumption here? I showed you this hockey puck of blood moving forward, right? And you're insinating this hockey puck of blood to get the distance or the length. But what if the flow profile is actually like this? And what if you've got a pulsed wave system and you're only insinating this fast moving parcel of blood in the middle? Well, then your VTI, your distance or your length would actually be based on the fast moving blood. And if it's a, a pulsed wave system, with a wide aperture, 
you're actually going to get spectral broadening on top of that. So if you use the max velocity tracing here to use to calculate the distance, it'd be quite an overestimation. So the question I'm asking here is, does the VTI here represent the true distance of, of this entire mass of blood? And I think you'll agree that the answer is no. So this leads to this idea of a velocity gradient broadening. And this is something not like geometric spectral broadening, which is intrinsic to the ultrasound system. This is intrinsic to the flow profile. And so there's different kinds of flow profiles in the body, which you, you may or may not have read about. So in this situation, all of these red blood cells are moving quickly at the same speed. And let's say that this is the left ventricular outflow tract or the aortic root. And we'll call this plug flow, which is where this kind of flow, this kind of flow occurs. Again, all of, all of the scatterers are in the, in the entire cross-section of the vessel are traveling at the same velocity. It's plug flow. And that's quite distinct from laminar flow, where there is fast-moving RBCs in the center, and then there's progressive drag on them all the way out to the endothelial, endothelial lining, um, <clears throat> much like a newspaper rolled up and pushed from the middle. They form these leaves that wrap around each other um, with the greatest velocity in the center line, and this is laminar flow, um, or parabolic, or blunted parabolic flow profiles, and this is pretty classic for peripheral arteries, especially in the carotid and brachial. So how do we measure the volume and flow in a peripheral artery? Because I just told you that if you insinate only, only the center, you're going to grossly overestimate the distance that, that you're measuring as, as, as traveled by the blood. So there's a way that you can account for velocity gradient broadening. And when you do the flow, or the volume I should say, it's the area of the vessel multiplied by the mean velocity um, time integral. And this may be news to a lot of people because it was news to me. And I think I understand why people have been using the max interchangeably. And I've kind of already mentioned it. It's the difference between plug and laminar flow. So this guy on the left here is your aortic root or your LVOT. Okay, this is plug flow. And again, I said all of the red blood cells are moving at essentially the same velocity. So when you look at these um, spectrograms in a patient, it almost looks like a, a, a line drawn by a pencil. All of the scatterers are so tightly held together, clumped together. They're not really clumped, but you know what I'm trying to say. <clears throat> this, on the other hand, is a peripheral artery. This is a, 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 a parabolic or blunted, par blunted parabolic laminar flow. So the way that you can distinguish between these two flow, flow profiles is just looking at the spectrogram. When you look at a Doppler spectrogram, there's just uh, a, a more intensity and there's more scatterers that you can see looking at the spectrogram itself. It's smeared out as, as compared to this perfect line of pencil. And so what you're actually seeing when you look at that is the third axis, and it's the amplitude or the strength or the number of, of scatterers. And the analogy that I use is it's like this is the difference between uh, amplitude and velocity is like uh, 10 ambulances moving at 100 kilometers an hour, an hour versus one ambulance moving at 100 kilometers an hour. Both clusters are traveling at the same velocity, so they would have the same frequency shift. But the 10 ambulances, there's more of them, so they'd have a, loud, they'd have a greater amplitude or a greater power. Power is, the, is amplitude squared. And so if you were to do a three-dimensional graph and look at the amplitude of the scatterers uh, with respect to frequency or velocity and time, and you took a time slice right here, in plug flow, they would all be um, uh, centered over this high frequency. And so if you were to look at this third dimension, it would sort of look like this surfboard coming out uh, coming out at you. And then the way that you determine the average velocity here is you do a calculation called the centroid calculation. And what that does is it essentially determines the center of gravity of the surfboard, like if you could balance this on your finger. And that, let's say, is here. And then the frequency at which that occurs is the centroid frequency. And in plug flow, you can see that the centroid frequency and the max frequency 
or the, cent the centroid or the mean frequency and the max frequency are essentially right on top of each other. So when you do the VTI of the max and you get the distance, you're also getting the mean, and that's because they're all traveling at roughly the same velocity. It's very different uh, in a peripheral artery, where if you did a time slice here, and then here, it's silent, 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 and then they're all screaming at this frequency and then silent again. If you did a time slice here, it's silent to here, and then you hear uh, kind of a lower frequency and then a higher frequency and a higher frequency and a higher frequency, kind of all roughly at the same amplitude. And that's what you see uh, in a parabolic flow profile. And when you do the centroid here, get the center of gravity of, of the amplitude here, you can see that the centroid frequency is much less than the max frequency in green here. So they're, they're, they're dissociated. And in a blunted parabolic flow profile, as in a peripheral artery, the max to centroid or the max to mean velocity is always very close to 2 to 1. It's almost always double. And so when you calculate flow based on the max velocity in a peripheral artery, you quite often double the actual value. And I proved this to myself with the flow phantom in a very sophisticated pump in our lab. Uh, if you use the max VTI in a parabolic flow profile, you will almost always double the actual flow moving through the, moving through the system. And so how do you capture all those different uh, velocities moving through a peripheral artery? Well, it's this idea of uniform insonation. And it's hard to do with a PW system. Even if you do a wide gate, it still doesn't, based on the, the physics of pulsed wave ultrasound, especially at shallow blood vessels, even if you use a wide gate that encompasses the entire vessel, you're actually not sampling all of the red blood cells moving through. And you can see it, the difference here using a PW system between plug flow and laminar flow. It's quite different if you use a continuous wave system. Right? The continuous wave would ca capture the same as the pulse wave and plug flow because they're all moving at the same velocity. But in a parabolic flow profile, a continuous wave system will actually insinate all of the different velocities and you'll get that. Um, you'll be able to assess all the different frequency per amplitude spectrum and you can do that centroid calculation. So if the entire volume of a blood is exposed to a uniform ultrasound beam and the theta the angle between the beam and flow is constant over the entire volume then the mean frequency Doppler the mean Doppler frequency corresponds to the mean flow velocity in the vessel. And so this is really the, the metric you should be using when you're calculating volume or flow in a, in a artery with uh, less than plug flow. So that was all of the different aspects of velocity. Then the other thing we mentioned as a part of the, of the volume or flow calculation was area. This is a very brief slide. So if you look at various uh, vessel diameters in millimeters and then flow error on the y-axis, and let's just pretend we're looking at a six millimeter vessel to see how measurement error affects flow because it's pi r squared. So if you're off on your diameter or your radius, the, the error is amplified. So if you mismeasure by 1.5 millimeters, uh, you're going to have a 40 to 50 percent flow error, which is unacceptable. If you're measuring the six millimeter artery and you're off by only a millimeter, you're, you're going to get a 30 percent flow error, also unacceptable clinically. Uh, if you're off by only half a millimeter, you start approaching somewhat acceptable error uh, in the clinical realm, which is 10 to 15 percent. Uh, but even if you're off by only 0.2 millimeters, you still have a plus or minus 10% flow error uh, when, you're in, when you're measuring flow through a 6 millimeter vessel. Uh, and so if you're doing something like uh, a brachial artery, which is even smaller, uh, the, the error is magnified. So uh, these kinds of measurement errors are well within reason. Even if you're the best sonographer in the world, some of these are at the limit of um, the... Uh, the measurement error of the device itself. Uh, so it, it calls into question uh, using really accurate changes in flow in, in smaller uh, vessels in the periphery. So very briefly in review, volume or flow is the area times the mean velocity, not the max. It, it's 
the max is okay in the LVOT and the aorta because it's plug flow and they're essentially the same. So as we saw, there's inherent variabilities of uh, high angles of incination because of that cosine effect. There's inherent variability with um, wide aperture transducers, not necessarily just linear trans linear array, but, but if there's a wide aperture, then there's a higher risk of geometric spectral broadening. Um, the velocity profile in the artery itself poses sampling problems, uh, especially if you're just sampling a narrow portion of the, the inside of the vessel with the pulsed wave system. And then with error, small errors in measurement leads to large errors in flow. It also assume, assumes a constant circular shape. And then the small errors in the diameter may not be due to the sonographer, but just be inherent to the ultrasound itself. Thanks for listening.